welcome all of you to the second talk of the online talk series organized by 137 members which is the physics club at isebrahampur so today we are very excited to have a special guest among us professor subir sarkar who has done pioneering work in astroparticle physics and cosmology he has a very inspiring academic background and experience starting from iit kharagpur from where he completed his bsc and msc and he has done his phd from tifr bombay and he has he has he was also a staff researcher there he has held various visiting positions at renowned renowned places like oxford university cern geneva and rutherford appleton laboratory he has also worked for eclavia an ngo in bhopal contributing to science education and outreach since 1990 he has been at the university of oxford and is currently a professor emeritus at rudolf byers center for theoretical physics as the title of today's talk suggests professor sarkar will share his insights into the current state of standard cosmology and possible associated challenges so over to the professor sarkar for the talk thank you very much and i'm sorry about the delay in starting uh, but i'm glad that i see uh, about 40 of you are online so that's a good audience now um, i'm going to talk to you about cosmology and i realize that uh, perhaps you haven't yet had um, all of you may not be familiar with the subject with um, i guess you have done special relativity that's all uh, i will assume for the purposes of this talk there will be a little bit of gr uh, general relativity but i'll explain that uh, when the uh, appropriate moment comes so let me start by uh, showing you what is our standard cosmological model uh, what you see on the screen there is a, a simulation done on a supercomputer of the formation of structure in our standard model of cosmology Uh, in a sea of dark matter this is the main constituent of the matter part of the universe and about two thirds of the universe is supposed to be uh, constituted of a cosmological constant also called dark energy which is believed to be accelerating the expansion rate and uh, the thing to take away from this picture is that it has a lot of structure what you see there um can you see my pointer as i move it on the screen yeah so yeah okay good so these uh, things that you see here these long filaments and uh, sheets these are um, actually in cold in dark matter so uh, they have been made visible for the purposes of this uh, picture and the idea is that we are one little point one little galaxy embedded in one of these sheets somewhere but overall the picture if you notice is uh, in fact statistically isotropic it is not uh, exactly isotropic but if you average over some large domains you'll find that this picture like a frothy bubble in a liquid it's statistically isotropic now the whole cosmological model rests on that assumption that we have a isotropic and homogeneous space time metric Uh, uh which is called the friedman lemaitre robertson walker metric and it is based on that assumption that we construct the model and we uh, interpret the data and we come to that conclusion which i gave you that um, about two thirds of the universe is a cosmological constant and one third is uh, mainly dark matter the baryons that we are made of is a tiny part of it so uh, the question is is this standard cosmological model correct so in science you need to test everything constantly and my motivation for this particular uh, line of research that uh, i have been doing now for the last 10 or so years is something that i learned from uh, denis sharma who was my mentor here when i first came to oxford um, you may not all know about him he is in fact more famous for his students uh you know people like stephen hawking and he also inspired roger penrose um there are others i could name john barrow uh, james penny uh, philip candilas he has had many illustrious students and in his book in 78 uh, 
He said, none of us can understand why there is a universe at all. Why anything should exist? That is the ultimate question. But while we cannot answer this question, we can at least make progress with the next simpler one of what the universe as a whole is like. So I interpret that to mean that he is exhorting us before we ask kind of big philosophical questions as people tend to do in cosmology to first give a description of the universe uh, and uh, you know uh, try to see whether we can understand its basic makeup and uh, content, right? So to do that, uh, let us go through a little bit of history first. The standard cosmological model is nothing new. Every culture in history has a cosmological model. So, you know, the aboriginals of Australia have a cosmology that goes back 35,000 years, right? Same with the ancient Hindus, the Mayans, the Incas, everybody has a cosmology. The one that uh, we have inherited in sort of modern science is what prevailed in Europe, which basically was started by the ancient Greeks. And at that time, uh, you will all know, this was all Aristotle and Ptolemy and so forth. The idea is that we are at the, the center of the universe and the known planets all go around us in circular orbits. The Greek thought circle is good because it's a, you know, it's a, a very symmetric figure. And if you look far enough, you see this uh, glass sphere, they called it the prima mobile of stars, which are fixed, which don't move on the sky. And this picture was actually a very good fit to the data. That's what the universe looks like. All the planets and the moon and the sun, they are all going around us. We can see it every day. And now it took a long time for uh, it to be realized that actually we are not the center of the universe. In fact, we are orbiting around the sun, just like all the other planets. And this was the Copernican revolution, uh, which was uh, something like uh, early 16th century. But basically all that has happened, if you look at these two pictures, is that we just interchange the sun and the earth. The rest of it remains the same. Same out the planets. Sorry? Somebody saying something? No, no, no. It's, it's, sorry, sorry. You can go. Yeah. If you just mute all the other participants, that would be better. Okay. Now, um, so the basic change is this uh, uh, kind of reversal of roles between the earth and the sun. Now, four centuries later, in the beginning of the 20th century, the first cosmological models were constructed using the newly formulated uh, theory of relativity by Einstein. And in fact, uh, last year or two years ago, we had the centenary of Friedman's equation. Friedman was actually an aeronautical engineer. And Lemaitre, uh, who came after him, was in fact a Belgian clerk, um, a cleric, a priest. And uh, then came Einstein. Now, they in fact uh, went a bit further than uh, what Copernicus had done. They said the sun is not the center of the universe either. And the reason for this is because when you observe the universe, you know about light cones. We are traveling along some world line and everything we see about the universe comes along our past light cone or within it. So if I do dating of uh, radioactive rocks, I'm basically looking back along like past my, my world line. If I am collecting astronomical data, I'm collecting it along my light cone. Now, what is clear is that we can only do this from our particular vantage point in the universe. We can't, you know, go to the edge of the other edge of the universe and see if the view is the same from there, right? So we have to make a philosophical assumption. We have to say that our position is not special. So this is, if you like, elevating the Copernican idea to say that every point is the same. No point is special. And this is called the cosmological principle. And it was actually formulated by Edward Milne some years later, although it is actually implicit in all the early work I mentioned. Um, and Edward Milne was, in fact, the Rouseball Chair of Mathematics here at Oxford, uh, the same chair that Roger Penrose later held. And uh, this is the philosophical underpinning of the standard model of cosmology, because on the basis of this cosmological principle, saying that all points uh, are the equivalent, 
the universe appears the same to all observers. In that case, if we see the universe as isotropic, then the universe must also be homogeneous because every observer must see it as isotropic. Right? Now, uh, when this uh, 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 cosmological principle traveled to Cambridge, they took it one step further. So as it says, models of the universe have been proposed by, you know, Willem de Sitter, Mill, Bondi and Gold and Hoyle and so on. They went further by saying, not only are we not special in space, we are not special in time. So we are at some random point in time. And that would be then the perfect cosmological principle. So, you know, from a philosophical point of view, that is the ultimate, right? Uh, act of demotion, if you like. And it is based on this that Bondi and Gold constructed the so-called steady state theory of the universe, in which nothing basically changes in the universe. It's always been there. It will always be there. Now, this beautiful idea was shot down by one observation. And that was the famous detection by Penzias and Wilson using this radio telescope at uh, in New Jersey, Bell Labs, uh, Homedale, uh, of a uniform radiation coming from all parts of the sky, which is depicted here as a orange uh, uh, projection. And the temperature of this is about three degrees Kelvin, 2.7 to 6 degrees, right? Of course, these guys only measured at one frequency and it took quite a long time till 1992, in fact, when a satellite was launched by NASA called the Cosmic Background Explorer. And that measured the spectrum of this radiation and it found it to be exact match to a black body at that temperature, which is shown there, 2.7 to 6 degrees Kelvin, right? Those error bars that you see there, they're something like 40 sigma. So, you know, there is no question that what we are seeing is a perfect black body. And that means that that definitively kills the steady state theory because although the energy density of this radiation is comparable to that of starlight, so Fred Hoyle and uh, Jain Nalikar and so on quite cleverly pointed out that, you know, it could be just reprocessed starlight. But in order to make that good a black body, you'd have to have a lot of reprocessing. You'd have to be essentially surrounded by the particles that are scattering the starlight and creating microwaves. And you would need so many of these particles that the rest of the universe would be just blocked out. You wouldn't see it. So that kills it. Nevertheless, uh, we clung on to the spatial cosmological principle, even though we abandoned the perfect cosmological principle. Right? Why is that? Well, if you read Weinberg's classic textbook, which I learned cosmology and gravitation from, it says... The real reason for our adherence to the cosmological principle is not that it is surely correct, but rather that it allows us to make use of the extremely limited data provided to cosmology by observational astronomy. Fair enough, right? You start with the simplest possibility. But uh, Weinberg also went on to say, if the data will not fit into this framework, then we shall be able to draw some very fundamental conclusions that either the cosmological principle or the principle of equivalence is wrong. Nothing could be more interesting. For some reason, this has been forgotten by cosmologists. We have developed the standard model of cosmology based on the cosmological principle. But although we now have data, which we did not have in 100 years ago, we have not been really doing this testing. And that is what I propose to now do in this talk. So we are back to this picture, right? And the first thing that we do in cosmology is we construct a metric, a metric for space-time, because a metric is what allows you to measure, right? Space-time intervals, events, essentially map out everything that has happened. And the metric is written in terms of this uh, G mu nu, you know this. And I have actually written it in a very suggestive form. It looks like a Minkowski metric because... For space-time, the real metric uh, actually is, uh, in terms of time, it looks different, the Friedman-Robertson-Walker metric. But I have redefined a quantity called eta, which is conformal time, which is dt squared divided by the scale factor A of uh, eta. A is the only dynamical parameter. So the idea is that you have a metric that can stretch or contract uniformly, conformally, right? And that is called the Robertson-Walker metric. 
Now with this metric, I can construct the Riemann tensor, I can construct the Ricci tensor, I can consider the construct the Ricci scalar, R, and so on. And I can relate that through Einstein's great intuition to the energy momentum tensor on the right hand side. And the connecting thing is, of course, Newton's constant of gravity. Right. Now, initially, when people did this, T mu nu was taken to be uh, the energy momentum tensor is just the uh, the content of the universe is just what they call dust, non relativistic particles, which have no pressure, uh, but only uh, mass energy, right? Uh, so pressure is basically kinetic energy, right? And kinetic energy for, you know, for example, the air in this room does have kinetic energy, but it is completely negligible compared to their mass energy. Of course, if you have radiation, for that, the pressure is about one third of the, the, of the energy density more substantial. And if you have a contribution to T mu nu from quantum fields, and this was recognized in the 1920s, 30s by when Pauli and Zeldovich and others uh, applied quantum field theory to cosmology, you get a contribution to T mu nu from the zero point fluctuations of the fields, which is got a pressure which is negative of the energy density, right? This is because the vacuum of quantum field theory must look the same to all inertial observers. And so you get a contribution that looks like a cosmological constant. Normally, a cosmological constant is what you add to the left-hand side of this equation uh, because the underlying symmetry, the general coordinate invariance, allows you to add any term proportional to the metric to the left-hand side. And this lambda is completely undetermined. Right? Nothing in the theory specifies it. Now to that, we are adding something from the quantum fluctuations of the fields, which in principle should be specified for the quantum field theory. But actually, in practice, it is not calculable because it is what technically we call a super renormalizable term in the Lagrangian. We can only estimate its order of magnitude. And the lambda that actually enters into the cosmological equation, the Friedman equation, is the sum of these two contributions, one from geometry and one from the matter fields occupying the universe. And these two things don't know anything about each other, right? Except in special backgrounds, they don't know that the others exist. And yet, they must somehow conspire so that there's some lambda which enters into the Friedman equation uh, is of the order that is specified by astronomy. So, you know, think about that. Now, this is basically a four by four uh, tensor, right? So there are 16 uh, components, but in fact, it is symmetric because the distance from me to you is the same as the distance from you to me. So there are only 10 independent equations, but they all collapse into one equation because of this assumption of this Friedman Robertson uh, uh, Walker metric. So I can write now the scale factor change with time as simply governed by the energy content in matter, the curvature of spatial sections, and then there is this lambda term, which I just explained. And if I divide through by h square and consider the present day, h sub zero means the Hubble parameter today, then I can write it quite suggestively in terms of omega matter, omega curvature, and omega lambda, which are defined as here, okay? So basically, uh, we are uh, talking about the fractional contributions of matter, curvature, and lambda to the critical density. And of course, if I write it like that and divide through by H0 square, you see this is just giving me a sum rule that these three components must add up to one, right? This sum rule is the essential content of the standard cosmological model. There are only three terms in it because we allowed only three terms. We have only allowed matter, which can include radiation, we have allowed for a spatial curvature and you have allowed for a cosmological constant, right? This is because it all rests on this completely isotropic and homogeneous assumption uh, metric, right? If we had allowed for other things, for angular momentum, vorticity, you know, all kinds of other stuff, then there would be other terms in the equation and therefore there would be other terms in the subgroup, right? Please keep that in mind because what we now do is we look at observations, we look at the Hubble diagram of type 1a supernovae, at what rate they are receding from us. 
and we look at the fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background and we construct the angular power spectrum. The peak is at about one degree. You see the spots are typically one degree in size. And that corresponds to a multipole of about 200. We look at uh, the same oscillations that you see imprinted here in the microwave background, which are due to the coupling of baryons and photons before the universe becomes neutral and transparent. The same oscillations are also imprinted in the power spectrum of the clustering of galaxies, uh, which are although a lot less pronounced, uh, but these are called the baryon acoustic oscillations. And what has been done is to use this data to infer that omega 0.8 times omega matter minus 0.6 times omega lambda is about negative minus 0.2. That is coming from the supernovae. From the position of this uh, first peak in the microwave background, we can infer that the spatial curvature of uh, the universe is close to zero. And omega matter, we infer from baron acoustic oscillations, clusters, etc., to be about 0.3. So you can see what's going to happen. I'm going to put omega k equal to zero. I'm going to put omega matter equal to 0 0.3. And therefore I infer that omega lambda is 0 0.7. That is the dominant constituent of the universe. What is omega lambda? It is lambda divided by three H naught square. So what that means is that this lambda term in the, in the Einstein equations, that is of order the present day Hubble parameter square. Okay. And the present day Hubble parameter in particle physics units, so basically it's uh, 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Uh, so that means it has units of inverse time. And if you uh, convert that into a scale that corresponds to a size of the universe, inverse of that, that's about 10 to the 28 centimeters. And you know that the bigger the size, the smaller the energy scale, 10 to the 28 centimeters is about 10 to the minus 12 GeV. Yeah just like uh, one Fermi, 10 to the minus 13 centimeters is about uh, 200 MeV, right? That is the typical energy scale of nuclear physics. So we, what we do is we, from the data, we infer that lambda is of order H naught square, but that has, uh, uh, that is the actual term in the Einstein equations. We interpret that as being an energy density by writing it in Planck units, which means we divide by 8 pi g. Remember, 8 pi g enters in all this stuff. So 8 pi g is basically 1 over 10 to the 19 GeV square. That's the Planck mass. And this, therefore, is a very tiny scale. It's 10 to the minus 12 GeV or 10 to the minus 3 electron volts, which is the same as the temperature of the microwave background today. This is not a coincidence. If you go through these equations, you'll see why we have to get it to be of that order. So the point is that the only scales which are coming in, I mean, as a particle physicist, I would always ask, where do the numbers come from? Where do the dimensionful quantities come from? Because we ideally want a theory where nothing is put in by hand. Here, we are putting in Newton's constant. That is a huge energy scale. But we are also putting in the Hubble parameter, which is a very small energy scale. And what we are inferring for the vacuum energy density is the geometric mean of this and this, you see? And that is where this huge hierarchy, which people are troubled by, comes from. Now, the problem with interpreting lambda as vacuum energy is that, as you saw, omega lambda is 0.7, omega matter is 0.3. They're of the same order of magnitude. But omega matter changes as 1 plus z cube. If I go to a redshift of 10, it's a 1,000 times bigger. But omega lambda is the same. If I go to a redshift of 1,000, which is the time when the universe became neutral, then the matter density would have been 10 to the 9 times bigger. But omega lambda is the same as today, right? So why is it that we are observing this coincidence today? So people construct lots of complicated models of scalar fields called quintessence fields, which in fact then have some infrared uh, fixed point in the coupled equations of motion. And that explains this uh, coincidence. But to do that, I have to invent a field whose height, if you think of this Mexican hat potential, the height of the field is 10 to the minus 12 GeV, but its curvature has to be of order the Hubble parameter because otherwise this field is not going to be slowed down by the Hubble expansion, which it needs to be 
to display this tracking behavior. So you see that it's the same hierarchy, 30 orders of magnitude, which we had for the cosmological constant. And the same comment applies to models in which you modify gravity on some scale. So for example, you could say maybe gravity is weak today because it, uh, you know, we, it, it, we, it propagates in more than our three plus one space time dimensions. Um, and uh, that's why the other interactions are so much stronger than gravity. But the only natural scale in gravity is the Planck scale, which is uh, from the Planck, uh, from, uh, you know, 10 to the 19 GV. So it's some tiny number like 10 to the minus 34 centimeters or something. But we want this to be important cosmologically. So we have to say that gravity is modified on the Hubble radius. It's the same fine tuning. We are putting that scale in by hand. So to cut a long story short, every attempt theoretically to explain dark energy puts in the Hubble parameter today, the measured expansion rate of the universe by hand, right? And surely you have to agree with me that H naught is not a fundamental quantity. It is not even a constant. It has no role in a fundamental theory. So you might say, okay, why don't I make lambda of order h squared, not h sub zero squared? This is a lot of quantum gravity theories have tried to do this. But um, as is quite obvious, if you look at Friedman's equation, if I have if lambda is proportional to h squared, why can't I just take it on the left-hand side? And then you see, I'm just renormalizing Newton's constant, right? So this is not going to work. It's A, not going to give accelerated expansion, and B, we can't mess with Newton's constant. It is, in fact, the same in space as in Earth to within a few percent. So the question one can ask is, are we inferring this from observation simply because this is the only dimensionful parameter in the friedman robertson lemaitre walker model, right? And in fact, it enters into every observation. So this is imposed by construction, okay? Now, uh, okay, this is an advanced remark for those of you who are theoretically inclined. If you have a universe which is dominated by lambda, it is called a so-called de-sitter universe. It's a universe which is expanding exponentially. In such a universe, uh, de-sitter space, there is no future horizon. Okay, And so you can't do ace matrix. Ace matrix just means that to something comes in, collides, and then goes out to infinity, and you have to conserve the number of particles. Okay, the most basic thing you can do, unitarity. You can't establish unitarity on DC space because there is no future infinity. So how are you going to check that what came in is what went out? And recently there has been a lot of work uh, suggesting that any theory of quantum gravity uh, is not, uh, you can't allow DC vacua, you can't allow a cosmological constant. In fact, these authors here formulated in terms of uh, saying that most string theory vacua are actually a so-called swamp land rather than, um, uh, you know, possibility for in, of uh, accommodating our universe as we know it. So since, since um, you guys are technologically minded, you might ask yourself that scale of lambda that I mentioned, what does it mean in terms of a distance? Well, if you have a, a milli-electron volt scale that corresponds to a distance of about tenth of a millimeter, so basically you would expect that something funny is going on on that scale. Maybe gravity gets modified. And one possibility is that, you know, you get you just multiply the usual inverse square law. You put a Yukawa-like coupling in there, right? And then you try to determine if this modification is actually happening. So people have been doing very clever experiments, uh, essentially versions of uh, torsion balance experiments, to try to determine if the you know Newton's law is modified on small scales. And this is a plot showing the bound that has been placed on this coefficient alpha as a function of lambda, the scale here. And this is the dark energy scale, 0.1 millimeters. And this is roughly where you'd expect alpha to be, around 1 if there was any modification. In fact, the current bounds are already an order of magnitude below and they are pretty good to go further down, right? There's no evidence. In fact, there's no evidence for any of the proposed modifications of gravity. There are so-called chameleon mechanisms, symmetron and so on. There's no experimental evidence. Nevertheless, we like this lambda CDA model for the following reason. It gives a 
nice account of how structure formed in the universe. So here we are today. Uh, this is the last scattering surface of the cosmic microwave background at a redshift of a thousand. And this was, as you say here, about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. Now, you see these fluctuations on the microwave background. We don't know how they were created. We have in mind a possibility that there was some process called inflation, which created them in the very early universe. Now, these fluctuations are basically fluctuations in density. So once these fluctuations are released uh, from the coupling with photons, they can grow under gravity and uh, they can, uh, you know, just uh, by sheer gravitational collapse, create the objects that we see in the universe today, that large scale, uh, uh, you know, tapestry of clusters and so forth. And all this kind of fits together very nicely. Actually, it doesn't quite fit together. We can't do this job if we, the universe has got just got the matter that couples to photons. The fluctuations have to start growing before the universe became transparent. Uh, and therefore, you have to invent uh, dark matter. You have to say there is about five times more dark matter that doesn't couple to photons, but which will support the growth of these fluctuations even before the universe uh, became neutral, right? And uh, therefore, uh, we have just had to invent something. But, you know, having given that, it all works. And dark matter is not so implausible. There are many candidates in new physics. You know, it is possible that uh, we are not the only kind of matter in the universe. However, the real universe that we see is because of the structure formation very inhomogeneous. Okay, it doesn't look like a, the FLRW model, which is exactly isotropic and homogeneous. So our local universe has been mapped. This is a scale of 200 megaparsecs. So for uh, uh, context, uh, we are at the center of this picture. We are about uh, one megaparsec is away from our nearest neighbor galaxy, that is Andromeda. Uh, we are uh, about 20 or so megaparsecs away from the, Vir we are part of the Virgo cluster, right? Which has got a scale of order tens of megaparsecs. But we are moving towards the Shapley supercluster, which is at about 260 megaparsecs. So these thin lines that you see here are velocities. So people have mapped this out very carefully. And you can see it's highly inhomogeneous. If we do a survey of galaxies, this has been done by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, we can go out to 600 megaparsecs. For reference, the Hubble radius is about 3,000 over little h. So let's say 4,000 megaparsecs. Okay, so we are talking about here something like uh, one sixth of the size of the universe. Okay, but what I'm going to ask you is we treat this universe as homogeneous. We say that we are typical observers, we assume that all directions are equivalent. Is that really true? Is are we am I going to see the same universe if I look along, sorry, along this direction as along this direction? Uh, does it matter? Does it not matter if I'm in a dense over density or in a void in a empty region? Surely it should matter, because gravity always responds to the local matter density. That's what we learn in general relativity. Also, we are moving towards the Shapley supercluster because of you know inhomogeneity. Something is pulling us. We are not in the Hubble flow. But this peculiar velocity should die out as we go to bigger and bigger scales and the universe should become more and more homogeneous, right? Is that actually happening? Now, quite some time ago, 67, Denis Shama, who I mentioned, realized that this peculiar velocity means that we could not see the microwave background as being totally isotropic. We should see a dipole anisotropy simply because you know, if you do this exercise in special relativity, this was first calculated by uh, Jim Peebles and David Wilkinson. They uh, pointed out that the temperature should vary uh, with angle theta from the hotspot uh, as this formula where beta is our velocity, you know, V over C. This is really an exercise you do in your you know, relativity lectures, right? And if that is so, then we can infer that you are moving at 370 kilometers per second because this uh, change in the temperature is about 1 milli-degree Kelvin, right? So delta T by T is roughly V over C. Now, our motion is actually a bit more complicated. 
because uh, this is a map from actually from uh, Planck, but you know, Kobe saw something similar. We are moving, the Earth is moving around the sun, but the sun is moving around the galaxy. And in fact, we are moving in the opposite direction to the hotspot. So the velocity around the galaxy adds to that 370 kilometers per second. On top of that, we are falling towards Andromeda. We are falling towards each other. We are in orbit. In fact, Andromeda will merge with us in 5 billion years. And all of the us, Andromeda, us, Magellanic clouds, the so-called local group of galaxies, we are moving uh, towards this uh, great attractor, Shapley, whatever it is, some supercluster, at about 620 kilometers per second. Right. Now, why are we moving? As we discussed, it is because the universe is supposed to be locally homogeneous. But the idea is that if I average on sufficiently large scales, this motion should disappear. And then we should find ourselves just in this smooth Hubble flow. Right. So basically, everything that is measured in astronomy, people first boost, do a special relativistic boost to the microwave background frame in which the universe should look isotropic. They do a boost with this velocity, right? And the assumption is that in that frame, I can use all these equations we just looked at because there the universe is isotropic and homogeneous, at least statistically, everything goes through, right? Now, the first problem with this is that this local peculiar velocity, which is called the bulk flow, is not behaving as it should. So if I do a calculation in lambda CDM, of at what rate this velocity should fall off as I average on larger and larger scales, the prediction is that purple line, right? Of course, there are uncertainties because we are in a very inhomogeneous field, depends on exactly where we are, that goes by the name of cosmic variance. So here is a one and two sigma cosmic variance uh, uh, error uncertainty bands. So you see that the measurements to date Although they don't look like they're falling off, they're consistent within the uncertainty, although they're all on one side of the purple line. And in fact, this data point was obtained by us, that is with Jacques Collin, Roya Mohai, uh, Mohammed Ramiz and myself. However, recently the Sloan Digital Sky Survey has published a new data point and they are just outside the two sigma variance, right? And even more recently, the Cosmic Flows 4 survey, which is the successor of the picture that I showed you, that was Cosmic Flows 3, they say that it is actually quite discrepant. They are seeing a huge velocity out at 200 over little h megaparsecs. So that means about 200 uh, times 3 over 2, so about 300 megaparsecs, right? They're seeing this. And you might ask, can this kind of high velocity at that distance be just a statistical fluctuation? So when we got made this measurement, we estimated that it could be a fluctuation. Probability of that fluctuation is less than 1% because we looked in a huge simulation and we asked, is there any neighborhood that looks like ours? And the answer is less than 1% of the time. But now, given these data points, that probability is less than 0.002%. So basically, it is extremely unlikely. We are definitely not Copernican observers. And that actually, technically, for cosmologists, that is very uh, significant. I won't go into that here. Let me come to the main topic of my talk, because I see I've already taken uh, quite a lot of time with the preamble. But, but you know, I, I want, uh, I, you know, you, you should be able to follow the whole talk. Otherwise, there's no point in my giving it. So I'll keep it simple. Now, if you pick up Jim Peebles' book on physical cosmology, he has a picture, which uh, caption of which says, look, the universe is isotropic because if I look at distant radio sources, they are you know, uniformly distributed on the sky. A long time I wondered what that streak in the picture was. That streak is actually our Milky Way galaxy because what this is doing is looking at the sky from a particular place called Green Bank in West Virginia, radio telescope. And you can't see the whole of the sky from there. So in the projection they have done, this patch here is the bits that you can't actually see. Okay. However, the statement in the caption is actually not correct. Because if you are moving with respect to the cosmic rest frame in which the sources are isotropic, then they can't look isotropic to us. There must be an anisotropy here we can't see that because there are only 35,000 radio sources here. This is from the NVSS radio survey. 
Why is that? Well, this was first pointed out by George Ellis, who is a noted uh, radiovist from South Africa, and John Baldwin, who was the head of the Radio Astronomy Laboratory at Cavendish uh, Labs in Cambridge. And they uh, noted something that actually had been pointed out, uh, you know, uh, 300 years earlier by Bradley, who was the civilian professor of astronomy at Oxford. And what Bradley had said is that the speed of light must be finite because a moving observer sees a star on the sky displaced along the direction of their motion. And he gave this formula, which is actually a formula of special relativity. And he gave it, uh, you know, in 1728. So, you know, over 200 years before uh, Einstein and others formulated special relativity. Uh, in fact, even estimated the speed of light from this uh, to within 15%. So, and we have to take into account another special relativistic effect, which is that if I'm a moving observer, then I frequencies are going to be Doppler boosted. So therefore, if I have a power law spectrum, not a black body anymore, but a power law is characteristic of the sources I'm looking at, then I'm going to be sampling a different part of the spectrum. Now, the number of sources above some flux falls off typically as some power of the flux, right? So essentially what is happening is that I'll see a dipole anisotropy in this distribution of sources, which is very similar to the CMB dipole. The same V over C cos theta will be there. But now it is multiplied by some additional term, which includes this X and alpha, which are these two power law indices. Okay. And I leave it to you as a homework exercise to calculate this. It's just special relativity. But let me show you figuratively what that means. If I have isotropic distribution of sources on the sky by, you know, illustrated by these points and I'm moving towards the red dot, then the aberration means the source positions will be compressed in that direction. And the Doppler boosting means that if I'm looking at a catalog in which I can only see objects over a certain flux limit, then uh, some of them will be shifted above that flux limit in the direction I'm going. And conversely, they will be uh, sh shifted below that flux limit in the backward direction. So I'll, I'll get a dipole. You can see a dipole here. You can see a more stronger concentration here and a weaker one here, right? Does the real sky show this? Well, here is the first catalog of radio sources uh, that was released in 1998 or so. And uh, this has got like 100. To do that exercise, you need over a million objects. So this was the first catalog that did that. But in fact, it was done from the very large array, which is in Socorro, New Mexico. It doesn't see the whole sky. It doesn't see that bit, which is down here. So what we did was we found another survey that had been done from a place called Molonglo in Australia. And that does that part. So if you put the two together, then you have a full sky survey. And of course, you make sure that the source densities are consistent in the overlapping part because these two maps are at slightly different frequencies. So you have to scale them to match. And we remove the galactic plane because that can give you a false dipole. You know, there might be an object very close to us by accident in the galaxy. And uh, we do various quality cuts. When we do that, we see that there is, in fact, a clear cos theta signature as we expected from that uh, theory. And you can even visually see the dipole, the hot spot and the cold spot. It is roughly in the same direction as the CMB dipole. But the velocity that we infer from the amplitude of this is a lot bigger than what we are expecting. Right? Now, this is something that actually had been pointed out earlier by uh, Ashok Singhal, who is a radio astronomer uh, now at PRL in Ahmedabad. Uh, but the problem is that this uh, finding was not taken seriously because we don't actually know if these radio sources are at cosmological distances, okay? Because the redshifts are not measured. And also you can do the following exercise. You can do a Monte Carlo simulation and ask how often would I see that pattern just by pure chance if I have these sources with this flux distribution. And um, Ramiz, my collaborator, who is now a reader uh, in the high energy physics department in uh, TIFR, he did the simulation 
we were both on ice cubes, so we know know how to do these things. Uh, and he said the statistical significance is only less than three sigma. I mean, you know, it's only about you know point uh, uh, sort of a few percent of the time, uh, less than one percent of the time this will happen. But it is you know it's still not that significant. So we uh, teamed up with Nathan Sacrest, who is a, a, a you know proper astronomer, unlike us. He's at the Naval Observatory in Washington, and he had a catalog of quasars, which have uh, was been constructed using this satellite called Wise, an infrared satellite that uh, has been operating for many years. I mean, after its cryogen ran out, it still operates at room temperature, and it measures the sky in four bands. I think only two of these bands are now working. And uh, these are at various wavelengths in the few micron range, right? 3.4, 4.6, 12, and 22 microns. What it is doing is a all-sky survey. And at those fre frequencies, you can see that a quasar spectrum is quite different from the spectrum of a L-star galaxy. L-star is basically a typical galaxy. Or, for example, a ultra-luminous infrared galaxy. All these things have characteristic spectra. So if you have four bands, you have a rough spectrum. And by just doing a color-color plot, so this is W1 minus W2 versus W2 minus W3, you can actually isolate uh, the quasars from the stars or spiral galaxies or ultra-luminous uh, infrared galaxies and so on. Right? That's what we do. We also make sure that our catalog is complete. So below a certain flux, the sky will not be complete. You will miss objects. So we make a cut where it is essentially complete. And we also do various other things because uh, this, uh, this uh, satellite was in a polar orbit. It was scanning across the sky. And you always check whether there is any, con any systematic trend with the ecliptic latitude because that is the scan pattern. And in fact, we found that below ecliptic latitude of, um, of uh, below, sorry, galactic latitude of 30 degrees, it was not resolving the sources, so we cut at that point. Even after doing all that, we have a catalog of 1.36 million quasars, which are every point that you see in this picture, these blue things are quasars. We have blocked out the large Magellanic cloud and the small Magellanic cloud as well. And the good thing is that we now have redshifts for them because part of the sky was also mapped by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey as part of their so-called EBOS program. This is to measure baryonic acoustic oscillations. And they have spectroscopic redshifts. And you can see that the mean redshift is uh, over one, it's 1 1.2. And 99% of them are at a redshift which is greater than redshift of 0.1. Their 0.1 redshift means more than 300 over little h megaparsecs, which means by that time the universe, uh, you know, their cosmological distance, right? So when you smooth this map, we see this dipole that we are expecting. And what we can now do is to compare this with what we expect. Now, of course, what we expect depends on what values of X and alpha we choose. Remember that formula, it had X and alpha in it. But the X and alpha have a distribution. So what we do is we sample these distributions at random and we run a make a false sky. Okay, we make 10 million false skies mock skies they're called and we calculate the dipole for all of them and then we ask is our real dipole uh, consistent with what you expect now we find that the direction of this dipole is actually consistent with the direction of the microwave background dipole which is the star here within the uncertainty but the amplitude is not this uh, gaussian that you see here is the 10 million simulations we have done of the expected dipole uh, for all these mock skies. And this red line here is what we actually observe. Now, only five of these 10 million simulations can come up here by accident. So that means the p-value, as we call it in statistics, I presume you know p-values, this is 5, 10 to the minus 7. And in terms of sigmas for a one-sided Gaussian distribution, that is nearly 5 sigma. 5 sigma is our holy grail because in particle physics, only if you get five sigma will you be taken seriously. Before that, 
you know, fluctuations are, uh, always happen and things come and go, but Phi Sigma is serious. The Higgs discovery was based on Five Sigma detection by two independent experiments. So this is getting interesting. In fact, if we take that radio map and we do a further bit of cleaning using the 408 megahertz galactic radio map and so on, and we lower our threshold a bit so you have more sources, then we find that the two dipoles in the radio sources and in the quasars are completely consistent. Um, and in fact, uh, the agreement between them improves uh, in direction if we first take out the CMB dipole. So I forgot to mention that what we are looking at are actually supermassive black holes. So you have a supermassive black hole, it's accreting matter, and sometimes it shoots out jets of plasma, and they end in um, sort of a big intergalactic blob by ram pressure, and that emits synchrotron radiation. So those are the radio sources. But in the infrared, we are looking down at that torus, which is surrounding the black hole, that is absorbing the radiation from the black hole and re-radiating it in infrared wavelengths. And those are our quasars. So although the central engine is the same, the two populations are selected very differently and the two catalogs are therefore have almost have no overlap. So what we did was they actually found there were 75 objects in common. We threw them out. So you have two independent catalogs. And now we are showing the offset from the CMB dipole and the amplitude of the uh, dipole that we are measuring. And this cross, uh, this, uh, this uh, little plus sign here, that is what you are measuring. And this spot here is what we expect from our theory. So you can see there's a clear discrepancy, even more so for Ys. And because these two um, uh, measurements are totally independent, they're two different catalogs, we can combine them. It's like, you know, Atlas and CMS, two independent experiments. So when you combine them, then we get a combined significance which exceeds five sigma. So as I said earlier, this work was done with Nathan Seacrest, who I mentioned, Mohammed Ramiz, Sebastian von Hausiger uh, is, is post, uh, Carlsberg postdoc here at uh, Oxford. And um, uh, Roya Mohai uh, is uh, from the Institute of Astrophysics in Paris. Right? We have been working together for some years now. Now, then some people said when we did this that, well, you are using a frequentist method, you know, in, with cosmologists like Bayesian methods. So an Australian group has done the analysis by Bayesian method and they report an even higher significance. Then people say, well, it might be a clustering dipole. In other words, you might be seeing by chance some object which is very close to us, right? Uh, in fact, that we can uh, uh, reject in a data-driven way. I'll show you in a second. This is a work by Tiwari, Zhang, and Nusser. Now, what they have done is they have taken our catalog and they construct the angular power spectrum. So we just looked at the dipole, which is this thing here. So this is the angular multipole. So um, this is the dipole. That's the quadrupole, octopole, et cetera, et cetera, going up to here, multipoles of a thousand. So multipole of 200 is roughly one degree and it goes inverse, right? So you can work out from that what this is. Now, as you see here, they have some lines here. This line is the expectation from lambda CDM. And in fact, it fits the data pretty well on small scales. These people say they can even tell when the, uh, you know, the fluctuations are going nonlinear. So instead of following the smooth line, they're following the dashed line, which is what you expect. Uh, 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 sorry, the other way around. Instead of following the dashed line, they're coming over to the smooth line. And this turn, turning off point tells you something about the bias of the sample, which means that uh, uh, the fluctuations are in the dark matter, but what we observe are the visible objects and they might be biased. They might be more strongly clustered or more weakly clustered than the underlying matter. And in fact, these quasars are more strongly clustered by a factor of two. That's called the bias factor, right? And having done all that, they can then extrapolate the lambda CDM expectation and work out statistically what this clustering dipole should be for the population. And that is, as you can see, is well below what we actually find. So what we are seeing is not a clustering dipole. Now I have to go a little quickly. I'm getting close to my uh, end of my time. 
So uh, this is uh, this group from Australia, Jaren Lewis and his collaborators. Lawrence Dam is actually, I just met him in Geneva a week ago. Um, um, they have done a Bayesian analysis and they find results very similar to us. They also are able to do something interesting uh, because they construct a likelihood. They examine an idea that uh, somebody called Charles Dalang and Camille Bonvan had come up with, who suggested that, that alpha and x that we are using, we are considering them to be independent, but what if they're correlated because of the strange way that these objects evolve? In which case, the, the expected dipole might be bigger than what uh, Ellis Baldwin formula gives, in which case the discrepancy is reduced, right? These people say that they consider the maximum possible correlation you can have, and that would then give you a slight shift in the uh, theoretical prior uh, shown by this dashed line. And in fact, therefore, any such effect can be no more than 17% of what we observe. Right? So that takes out that possibility too. Okay, very quickly, uh, let me just mention that some people also say you're doing a special relativistic calculation, but in the universe is, after all, general relativistic, you should do it properly. And we have done it properly. We have done taking the standard formulation of, you know, considering the null bundle uh, in our uh, past light cone and working out uh, from that what dipole you should expect for a population of objects, uh, you know, with some redshift distribution. And then you get a more complicated formula. Uh, let me just point out that effectively we then recover the Ellis Baldwin formula and a correction term. To determine this correction term, we have to know the distribution of the objects we are looking at in redshift and flux. And as it happens, we do know that, right? I showed you this distribution. This is from uh, the EBOS data. We, when we put plug this into this formula, we find that the correction term is less than one part in 10 to the fourth. So essentially, Ellis and Baldwin formula is pretty good, right? And uh, this, again, this calculation was done assuming X and alpha are independent, but I just mentioned that that uh, evolution can give you at most 17% of the value. So we, and also we don't see any uh, signature of evolution. So you might be asking yourself, if this is such a huge discrepancy, then has the cosmology community not paid attention to this? I mean, we published this in Astrophysical Journal Letters. This is all in Astro... And then this was published in Journal of Cosmology and Astroparticle Physics, uh, you know, a year or two years ago. So Jim Peebles is, you know, he is the doyen of our field. He was awarded, as you would really know, the Nobel Prize uh, two, three years ago for essentially having invented uh, the Lambda CDM cosmological model, among other things. Now, he has written a review article recently on anomalies in physical cosmology. And he says that our anomaly is as well established as the Hubble tension. Yet the literature on this kinematic effect is much smaller than the hundreds of papers with the phrase Hubble tension in the literature. And he says, I expect the difference is an inevitable consequence of the way we behave. So I leave it to you to figure out what he means by that. Uh, let me just say that this aberration effect that we see in the galaxies, you can also look for it in the microwave background, because if you are moving in a certain direction, then the aberration means that uh, you are breaking spherical symmetry, right? So isotropy. So if you do a, a multiple analysis of the sky, if you expand it in spherical harmonics, the spherical harmonics are no longer orthogonal to each other. They'll become correlated. And the Planck satellite uh, uh, looked for this correlation and they found it. So they found it only in one direction, not along the perpendicular direction. So what you see here is that they actually find, and these are the frequency bands in which they look, 143 gigahertz, uh, 217 gigahertz, etc. So basically what they found is that the effect is actually there, but it is marginal. As you can see, the uncertainties are large. So while they can infer the velocity just from this aberration effect, the uncertainties are very large. So this is consistent with 370 kilometers per second, but you know only at three sigma. But recently, uh, Tarun Saurudeep and collaborators uh, have uh, done a reanalysis uh, in a Bayesian framework, 
and they say that actually the significance is higher. They ask a different question, but that they can uh, reject at uh, higher significance. And uh, therefore, they are sticking to their guns that the CMB is in fact kinematic, the dipole. But if that is so, then the dipole we are seeing is cannot be entirely kinematic. I mean, one or the other can be kinematic. Now, what is the explanation of what we are seeing? Is it some intrinsic anisotropy? Is it some particular feature of the quasars? Do you have to really go back to the drawing board and reconsider the large scale geometry of the universe? All the classifications that had been given by Thurston, for example, and as in this paper. And uh, people have been looking at all these and many more. Here are just some recent papers that have been looking at it. Okay. Now, I see that I've already taken an hour, so I think I will uh, skip uh, the next few slides, which are about supernovae, and uh, come to the end. And if there are any questions, I can come back to that. Okay. So let me conclude. The standard model of cosmology, as I said, was established long before there was any data, right? It was 100 years ago. At the time, we didn't even know that we live in a galaxy. And so its basic assumptions, which is homogeneity and isotropy, have never been rigorously tested. Right? That is what the cosmological principle is, that universe is homogeneous and isotropic. Instead, what you have been doing is measuring the parameters of the model with precision. But actually, what we need to do is not precision cosmology, but accurate cosmology. Right? And what is the difference? Well, my colleague Nathan, the astronomer, he, he says it like this. You remember the Hubble Space Telescope, when it was first launched, they discovered that uh, the mirror, which had been very precisely ground, right, to the exactly the uh, given specification, it was actually not ground to the correct shape, okay? They had to put a corrector plate on it in order to make the bloody thing work. So you see, that is an example where something was very precise, but very inaccurate, right? So it might be that our current cosmological model is quite inaccurate, even if we know it precisely. And the reason we are saying that is because we find that the rest frame in which distant quasars and radio sources are isotropic is not the one in which the microwave background is isotropic. And according to our standard cosmology, they, they should share the same frame. Now, in particular, what this means is that the standard procedure we do of making measurements boosting them to this cosmic rest frame and making corrections of various kinds in order to infer acceleration uh, from type 1 supernovae. That is totally unjustified. In fact, uh, the slides I didn't have time to discuss show that if we analyze the data in the rest frame where we actually make the measurements, heliocentric frame, then we see the acceleration in the type 1 supernovae only in one direction in the sky, not all over. So it therefore cannot be due to lambda. It may be an artifact of uh, our being embedded in this deep bulk flow, which I pointed to earlier. Okay, So it is possible that we uh, might have to really go back to you know square one and start reconstructing cosmology. Fortunately, the kind of manifesto for that was given by George Ellis and collaborators. He called it the cos cosmological, the fitting problem. And he basically told us how to use data to construct a metric and to construct a model of the universe rather than base it on a philosophical principle. So I think I'll end here and by just saying that uh, the community is not yet convinced of this. I showed you what people said. But in fact, we are making a progress. People are coming around to our point of view. Other groups are beginning to check our results. And so far, they have confirmed them. We want more people to do that because in physics, as we know, we want to be cross-checked. We want to be uh, independently tested, right? We are not satisfied with just finding something ourselves. We want the entire community to accept that that is the measurement. So let me conclude by showing you the gravestone of David Hilbert, the great mathematician. And what it says in German is, where müssen usen? Where Weden Usen, which means we must know, we will know. So thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Sarkar, for the talk. 
it was wonderful to know about the observations advanced in sanitation of current standard model current standard cosmological model uh, there are few questions in the chat box sure uh, okay. that let me let know. me go to the chat box and see what have we got sorry see. i switched off the uh, control signals so let me get that back yeah um where are we um Oh, uh, just one second. I, I, in fact, switched off the floating controls. I have to figure out how to get them back. Just give me a second. Uh, here we are, Zoom. I can dictate them if you want. Um, yeah, show chat. I can see it now. All right. Okay. All right, let me start from the top. Uh, what does H stand for, Shashank Singh? Okay, H is the uh, A dot over A. So it's called the Hubble parameter. H stands for Hubble. In fact, uh, Santumanna has answered. It's not the Hubble constant. I'm uh, talking about the Hubble parameter. Hubble constant refers to the value of the Hubble parameter today, which is H sub zero. Uh, then somebody asked, the new theory is here, which explains the age of the universe is 27.6 billion years. Is it correct or under process theory? Well, you haven't told me what the theory is, so I don't know what, uh, what to answer. But no, I think we are pretty sure that the age of the universe is around 14 billion years. How are velocities at which galaxies move measured? Well, the basically Doppler shift. So the spectral lines of uh, the light that is coming from stars in the galaxy, or uh, these days we look at uh, the 21 centimeter line of hydrogen, that is shifted with respect to the rest frame. And from that, you can measure the velocity at which galaxies are moving. Uh, so yeah, Santumana has explained that using the Doppler effect, that's correct. So the dipole effect in CMB tells us that the boost to CMB rest frame isn't correct. No, it tells us that if I boost to the CMB rest frame, then in that frame, the distribution of matter is not isotropic. What could be the possible theoretical scenario behind the discovery found? We don't know. Something to do with lambda? No, it has certainly nothing to do with lambda because lambda by definition is isotropic. So the discrepancy would have to do with a mismatch between the, radi the radiation and the matter. Now, the radiation and matter were in thermal contact, at least back at a redshift of 1,000. It is possible that at the time and structure form, which was only around redshift of you know few, um, then at that point, something happened to uh, break this connection between the rest frames. We don't know what it was. Uh, Notice, however, that all the evidence for uh, accelerated expansion is also from the same epoch. It might all have to do with the formation of structure, which, of course, makes the universe inhomogeneous and isotropic. Avijan Kaur says, can modified theories like radiovistic mond explain such effects? Radiovistic mond, mond stands for modified Newtonian dynamics. So that is an uh, attempt to do away with dark matter. Uh, that has uh, nothing to do with dark energy. Is it the case that lambda LCDM has discrepancy with this anisotropy or is it inconsistent? With other? Yeah, LCDM by definition uh, uh, requires an isotropic universe. Okay, that is, it is based. It's the other way around. To infer uh, L, that is lambda, you have to assume that the universe is isotropic. So if the universe is anisotropic, then you can't uh, do the inference which I, I went through it in one of the early slides. I showed you how we start with a uh, friedman lemaitre robertson walker metric. Uh, from that, uh, we construct the Einstein equation and we reduce that to the Hubble, the Friedman equation for the Hubble parameter. And then we construct the sum rule. And from that, we infer lambda. So you see it all ultimately rests on the assumption of isotropy. Okay, I think I've uh, come to the end of the questions in the chat. Uh, are there any live questions? There is another question in chat now. Okay. Um, oh. The last one I is from Shashank Singh. I just answered that.
Okay. But if any of you have any other questions you can think of, you, you are welcome to ask me live. Oh, question so like that. Hello. Like, oh, oh yeah. Yeah, we can. I have a question. Yeah. Was there recently there were there were some works uh, by many of the physicists, especially the cosmologists. Uh, and from the ninograph data, we observed that uh, the gravitational wave background. So my question was that: Is there any relation between this uh, stochastic inflation, the theory which was given by uh, Starobinsky? Yes, and the gravitational background, like the stochastic gravitational background. Uh, is it like no, the, right the, 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 the wavelengths are completely different. So, if you are referring to these nanograph uh, observations, they are using a network of uh, radio telescopes monitoring pulsars, right? So, basically, pulsars are of order kiloparsecs apart. So, you're talking about gravitational waves of that wavelength. Anything from cosmological early universe physics, the wavelengths there are of order hundreds of megaparsecs. So you can't measure those using any uh, detector. Uh, the only way you can see primordial gravitational waves is in the cosmic microwave background where they create uh, a kind of um, uh, what's called B-mode polarization, a kind of a curl. And uh, that is something also that um, CMB detectors are looking for. But uh, the two have no connection. This um, stochastic background that has been seen is really, I mean, the most likely explanation that people have long considered is that it's just from all the, you know, uh, black hole and neutron star mergers over the lifetime of the universe. Okay, thank you. Can I ask, have, been, uh, have you uh, yet done, I mean, do you have a course in, uh, cosmology in your coursework at, in uh, any year? actually most of us have done projects in cosmology okay uh, like we didn't have any basic, basic course but in internships we have got exposure to oh okay okay i see okay. all right thank you yeah. thank you sir. Oh, one thing like upcoming uh, telescopes like euclid went and all so that would help in resolving this discrepancy like yes certainly uh, i didn't mention that yes uh, euclid not so much because Euclid is only going to look at about a third of the sky uh, for various reasons, operational reasons. It's not actually going to map the whole sky. Uh, but uh, I'm involved in something called the Large um, LSST, Large Scale Survey of Space and Time from the Rubin Telescope, which is on the ground in Chile. It's being uh, ready to take first light, I think, in a few months. Uh, of course, being on the ground, it only sees about 40% of the sky. But uh, it'll see millions and millions of quasars and supernovae and so on. Uh, the next satellite mission, which uh, we are looking forward to, which will, in fact, uh, uh, see a, a full sky, that is something called Sphere X, which has been approved by NASA. Um, and in fact, that might be actually launched as early as 2024. We'll see. And after that, there is W first, which will also add uh, more data. And uh, meanwhile, there is a satellite right now in orbit called E-Rosita, which is, maps the sky in X-rays. And it has already made several uh, maps of the sky. Unfortunately, this was a joint German-Russian mission. And uh, that collaboration has, as you can understand, broken down. And uh, the Russian part of the data has not been released. So that's a non-starter. So basically, I'm looking forward to, um, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention a very important source of data, which will come from something called the Dark Energy, uh, dark, uh, energy Spectroscopic Instrument, DAISY. Yeah. DAISY is on the Mayal Telescope in uh, in uh, in Kitt Peak, in, in uh, Arizona. And uh, they have already got, I'm told, five, six million red chips, and uh, there will be a data release perhaps by next summer. Uh, now, that also is a ground-based telescope, so it doesn't see more than 40% of the sky, but they have very accurate redshifts, and that is actually what will enable us to do kind of tomography of this dipole that we are seeing in order to identify its origin. So I'm looking forward to DAISY data release first, 
uh, followed, we'll soon have data from LSST and then Euclid and then W first and hopefully Sphere X already by that time. So yeah, the future is quite bright. Uh, also, one, another question, like you mentioned that uh, like the basic assumption of isotropy, there is problem with that. Like if we go by the new findings and all. So is there any recent work or something which takes uh, sort of uh, some other theoretical mo model which does not assume uh, the isotropy and then run simulations and see what is the effect on current state of universe or large Well, that or is something that I hope will happen. So far, not. So far, there have only been a few... Look, you are really going to have to reinvent the wheel. So this is not something that yeah. you do in a weekend. So basically, the people have started proposing theoretical possibilities, which are all very tightly constrained. I mean, to you know, to create a new standard model is not a trivial job. But people have started looking into the so-called Bianchi models, which are models that incorporate uh, departure from isotropy to see which ones might be phenomenologically viable. You know, you have to be consistent with all the other data as well. Uh, we are quite far from simulations and so on. Those are mainly done with the simplest possible model, right? Because they have their own challenges doing a simulation, which are mainly, in fact, Newtonian simulations. More recently, there has been interest, uh, there has been progress in doing general relativistic simulations, which is what we really need to do. But those are much more limited numerically than the Newtonian simulations. So, although in one respect, uh, people sort of think cosmology is a very mature subject, has achieved a lot, effectively, you know, from one way of <laughs> seeing it, we are really using a hundred year old theoretical model. And uh, we have just been pursuing that. Uh, for the past century to in greater and greater detail. And as I said, measuring its parameters with more and more precision. But now that uh, there is a serious question as to whether the model is actually accurate, is it really a you know good representation of our universe? We really have to uh, go back to the beginning. And the first thing that I'm, uh, you know, we are interested in doing is obviously getting the community excited about it because there are hundreds of cosmologists out there. Uh, and if they direct their attention to this, then I'm sure we'll have lots of nice new ideas and uh, you know the simulations that you asked for and all that. Okay. Yeah. All right. If you have any further questions, please feel to email them to me, I'll answer. Uh, but some of the questions that were asked, they, you know, uh, if I may say so, they suggest that, you know, uh, there's always news about cosmology in the media, right? Somebody comes up with something, immediately the, some report comes out. This this uh, first question about this 27.6 billion years. Now I know what that's about. There was a researcher in Canada uh, who suggested uh, something like that. But, you know, it was a speculative uh, uh, paper. Uh, I, and it is not at all, uh, uh, it has not uh, uh, been established, okay? Let me put it like that. It, it's not taken seriously. Now, that is not by itself uh, the criterion. You should always give every new thing a fair chance and judge for yourself whether you should take it seriously. But in order to do that, of course, you need a certain technical background. So I think uh, the it is helpful if you acquire that technical background so you can, you know, read a new paper and assess it for yourself. Okay. And uh, certainly by the time you are in your uh, third or, uh, uh, well, certainly by the time you're in your fourth or fifth year, but even in the third year, you should be able to follow most of the cosmological literature. Yeah. All right, then. Uh, so thank you for having me. That was uh, very uh, interesting. And uh, I found the questions also quite provocative. So as I said, feel free to send me more questions later if you think of anything. Okay. Thank you so much.
lecture on behalf of 137 and what's going on the party in regional talk yes and i'm very happy to see you are doing this activity uh, and it's really a uh, very cogent and useful thing to do to uh, you know bring all the physics students together uh, for talks like this and uh, let me know when you have put this recording online okay yeah. okay sir okay thank you very much so i'll say goodbye yeah. bye okay. bye bye